I am going to talk about a relatively new branch of science today. It is not a branch of science which deals exclusively with the world of the very large or the world of the very small, but rather it works equally well in all these scales and in particular works wonderfully well in the world around us. It is a subject called chaos. It was born as a confluence between physics and mathematics. However, from there it has spread to all branches of natural sciences and indeed to many of the branches of social sciences as well. But before we go into that, let us take a look at a bit of a backdrop in which this theory was born. Now, it is the aim of all sciences, and in particular it is the aim of physics, to predict the future. Given the situation today, you should be able to tell exactly what is going to happen. And one of the major tools that we use for this is what are called differential equations. And they help us predict future behavior of systems. But in order to solve these equations and get to future behavior, what we need are initial conditions. If we want to know what will happen to a cricket ball three seconds after it has been struck, what we need to also know is exactly what the velocity and position of the cricket ball is at this instant. So these initial conditions are very, very important. Now we had always known that it is impossible to exactly determine the initial conditions. However, we were always also confident that we can approximately measure the initial conditions to reasonably high degree of accuracy and use that to figure out what the situation is going to be in the future. An approximate value or set of values for these initial conditions will give us an approximate prediction. And not only that, this approximation can be made better and better by just improving upon the precision of our initial conditions. So in a sense, the whole world was basically bound by the laws of physics. It was what philosophers have called the clockwork universe. Now we can go into the philosophy of this. I am not an expert, but the philosophy, even at the level which I understand it, would take much more than the duration of this lecture to expound. And moreover, that will take us very far afield from our topic. People have talked about the fact that the clockwork universe rids human beings of their free will. Some people have said that it shows that the God has built the most exquisite machine of all time. Others, however, have argued that it actually takes God out of the entire equation. Once the clockwork universe is set up, nothing else has any role. The universe runs on its own. We already have had inkling from quantum mechanics with its inherent statistical nature that things are really not as well regulated as the clockwork universe suggests. However, even within the world of classical physics, things are not as clear-cut as they seem. And that's what chaos theory emphasizes. Now, as in almost all cases, it's impossible to actually pinpoint who discovered chaos theory or when it was really brought about. However, all would agree that one person played a rather important role in making chaos, if not a household name, at least a name in the tip of most scientists. This person is Edward Norton Lawrence. He was an American mathematician and meteorologist. And the way in which he became a meteorologist is quite interesting. After graduating in mathematics from Harvard, he joined the United States Army for the war and there he was part of the Army Air Forces and his role was that of a weatherman to predict weather for the flights that were carried out. This made him interested in meteorology and after his commission with the Army was over, he joined MIT's meteorology department, got a PhD there ultimately joined there to work and started making rather important contributions to the subject. In particular, he had developed a very important 
theory about atmospheric circulation. So, by the time the events that we are talking about took place, he was already a very important name in meteorology. Now, what he did, where our interest lies, is that in the late 1950s, he started working on a then new field of numerical weather predictions, where people would use the newly acquired computer systems to do numerical calculations and work on mathematical models to predict weather. By 1961, Lawrence was using a simple digital computer, a Royal Mac B LGB30. This computer and some of its shortcomings actually played an important role in the discovery of chaos, at least in Lorenz's discovery of a chaotic system. What he was trying to do was simulate a model of the weather which involved 12 variables. He later on simplified this model by throwing away many of these variables and retaining only three of them. Now the actual numerical simulation part was handled by two computer scientists whose role is not emphasized enough in the history of the subject. The first one was Margaret Hamilton, who wrote the initial computer programs for this work and who had to leave for a project later. So what she did was she trained another computer scientist, Ellen Fetter. It was Ellen Fetter who actually carried out the numerical calculations and graphing that was required for the work where chaos was introduced. Now we don't really know much about Ellen Feta after this because it seemed that she did not really make any seminal contributions after this work. It is true that Lawrence acknowledged her work in his paper quite prominently. However, the history of science has sort of ignored her, which may be symptomatic of the times. Margaret Hamilton, on the other hand, is another story. True, her role in the discovery of chaos is not acknowledged, but it's not at all true that she has been lost to the history of science. She perhaps is one of the most celebrated women scientists of all time. Among other things, Hamilton is credited to be one of the people who coined the name software engineering. She was very well known, especially as a director of the computing effort which put man on the moon. Here, this is a famous picture we can see Hamilton standing next to the stack of software code written primarily by her and her colleagues, which ultimately managed to guide the lunar module onto the surface. However, it is still true that the work of both Hamilton and Ellen Fetter in developing the theory of chaos has not really been properly acknowledged. Be that as it may, let us continue with the story of what really happened when Fetter's numerical predictions were actually analyzed by Lawrence. In the quite by accident, Lawrence stumbled upon a very unexpected phenomenon. And in order to understand why this phenomenon is unexpected, I would like you to take a look at a bit of the mathematics behind the system. Don't worry, I'm not going to make it very technical. The Lorentz system, as I said, involved three variables. And they were a set of coupled differential equations. These are the equations. The precise form of these equations is not that important for our story. But what will be important, at least later, is the fact that it, the right hand side here for, say, the rate of change of y, the term like xz, or that for the rate of change of z, has a term xy. These are nonlinear terms, terms which do not scale when you just scale up the variables. Now, the precise nature of these quantities x, y, z, and the identity of the parameters sigma, rho, and beta is not that important, but I have listed them here for completeness. x is related to the rate of heat convection, y and z are horizontal and vertical temperature gradients, respectively. 
Sigma and Rho are dimensionless numbers called Tange's number and Reynolds number. Beta is another dimensionless number which, sig which essentially signifies the size of the system. But be that as it may, that's really not important for us. What is important is a basic understanding of how this program, this, this system, was simulated on a computer program. And the basic idea is very, very simple. If you remember your class 12 calculus, the quantities dx, dt, dy, dt, dz, dt are nothing but the rates at which x, y and z are changing with t, the time. So, if you are going to talk about a very small time interval, then the change in x in that time interval is simply going to be the value of dx dt at the, say, the beginning of the interval times the size of the interval. So, there, of course, is going to be an approximation because within the interval, no matter how small, the rate at which x changes will itself change. So, using the value at the beginning of the interval is bound to lead to some kind of an error. But we expect that if we take a small enough interval, that error will become rather small. So, if at time t equal to tn, the values of x, y and z are xn, yn and zn respectively, then at a time tn plus 1, tn plus delta t, what we will have is the value of x will become xn plus 1, which is the value of x at time tn, xn, to which you have added this quantity. This is nothing but the rate at which x is changing, at least at the beginning of the interval, sigma times yn minus xn, multiplied by the size of the interval. And we have done exactly the same thing for the other two variables as well. Now, this is a very, very simple-minded algorithm for calculating x, y, and z in the next time step. Of course, you don't stop there. You keep on repeating this over and over again. Once you know xn plus 1, yn plus 1, zn plus 1, you use similar reasoning to land up at xn plus 2, yn plus 2, zn plus 2, and go on from there. Now, this is not very accurate. Unless you take a very, very tiny time interval that has its own problems. Since this is not a numerical methods class, I'm not going to go into the other algorithms right now. What I really want to point out is this is a completely deterministic calculation. In other words, if you know xn, yn, zn precisely, then xn plus 1, yn plus 1, zn plus 1 will be precisely given. And if you keep on repeating this over and over again, you will keep on getting the numbers at each step as precisely as you want. There is no randomness involved here. In particular, if you start with the same set of initial values x0, y0, z0, and run the program several times, you are bound to get the same result every time. Not only that, if you were to stop at the middle, say, say at x40, y40, z40, and start again from x40, y40, z40, and go on, you should not be able to distinguish between whether you started from x0, y0, z0, or whether you stopped in the middle or not. The deterministic nature of these equations guarantee that. Now, this is where the real surprise came. In Lorenz's words, at one point I decided to repeat some of the computations in order to examine what was happening in greater detail. I stopped the computer, typed in a line of numbers that it had printed out a while earlier, and set it running again. I went down the hall for a cup of coffee and returned after about an hour, during which the computer had simulated about two months of weather. The numbers being printed were nothing like the old ones. In other words, by stopping his program in the middle and starting from the point where he st stopped, Lorenz ended up with entirely different numbers than the ones he would have had if he had continued from the beginning without stopping. Now, today's computers have become much faster, so I don't have to really wait an hour to simulate a month of weather or two months of weather. I can do it much faster on my mobile phone even. Now, I wrote a program to simulate what Lorenz had seen, and I'm going to show you the results now. For a specific choice of parameter values, rho equals 28, sigma equals 10, and beta equals 8 by 3. When I ran this simulation, I'm pretending that Lorenz ran the same simulation. When he 
he ran there at a stretch. What he got was this blue curve. I've just brought an X here. Now, if he were to run this by breaking off in the middle at t equal to 40, he would get this, the red curve. Now, unless you have very, very keen eyesight, you won't really see the difference between the two curves unless I put them together. And that's what I'm going to do now. If I superpose the two of them, notice that at the beginning, of course, for the first 40 units of time here, the two simulations are running side by side, basically because they are the same results. At the point t equal to 40, I stopped the simulation in one case, took out the numbers that were being printed out by the computer, at least pretended that I was doing what Lorenz had exactly done, and started the program again. Notice that for quite some time after that, say, around up to almost 45 or so, you can see no difference between the two curves. In fact, you can see only one curve. But after that, the difference starts to emerge and it starts to become more and more. So as you go further and further away, you see that these two simulations, which should have in principle given you exactly the same result, give you very different results. So this was an unexpected result. The explanation turned out to be perhaps even more unexpected. The explanation goes as follows. This is something Lorenz discovered after a lot of thought. The LGB30 calculated numbers to six decimal places internally. However, because of shortcomings of the hardware, it only printed out three decimal places. Now, calculating to six decimal places internally and printing out three decimal places is actually often a very good idea because very often when you calculate up to a certain fixed number of decimal places, the last few digits may become unreliable. On the other hand, you must realize that when Lorenz ran his full simulation beyond the midpoint, the computer was internally using the six decimal places values it had, whereas Lorenz, when he broke it up, gave it only three decimal place values that he had in the printout. And this was a very, very small change. So the resume run started with slightly different, I shouldn't really say slightly inaccurate, but slightly different starting points. And that made all the difference. This very small difference ultimately got amplified hugely in the long run. So this is the first evidence that we got of extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. And in this, the new science of chaos was born. Now this phrase, extreme sensitivity to initial conditions, may sound rather frighteningly technical, but I'm pretty sure most of you know of its more colorful, colloquial version, the butterfly effect. In 1972, Lorenz gave a talk whose title was, Does the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? It turns out that this name was not really given by Lorenz himself. In fact, he actually failed to supply the title for his talk for a long, long time. So, Philip Merrilis took it upon himself to give this title. But you all understand what this basic idea here is. A tiny effect somewhere far away can produce a huge effect if you have extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. This idea, however, was not really very new. This idea had a long, long history. This was the first time you were really seeing this in a well-controlled scientific context. But long ago, for example, in the 1800s, the philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte, in the vocation of man, wrote he could not remove a single grain of sand from his place without thereby changing something throughout all parts of the immeasurable whole. But what philosophy dreamt of a long time ago, science has shown that that really is true. It works out that a very tiny effect somewhere can produce a huge effect somewhere entirely different. But why butterfly? Indeed, when Lawrence used a similar phrase earlier, in earlier lectures that is, to convey the same kind of message, he did not really talk about a butterfly. He used a notion of a girl's wing flapping somewhere 
and causing a hurricane somewhere else. Maybe Bailey's was struck by the fact that a butterfly would be more poetic, but there can be, be another reason for this. And the reason is the following. If you had a plot, the trajectory of the point whose coordinates are x, y, and z, as it evolves according to the differential equations in Lorentz's system, for the specific parameter values that we talked about earlier, the curve that you get in space looks like this, which of course evokes the images of a butterfly's wings. Notice that this is a very, very intricate and complicated orbit, and what makes this even more interesting is that this rather strange looking object is an attractor. What that means is no matter where you start with, that is whatever your initial conditions are, in the long run, the trajectory is going to end up on this rather strange looking object. And from the strangeness of the object, it should not come as a surprise to you that this kind of thing is called a strange attractor. It is a special kind of geometrical entity called a fractal. Fractals are very, very fascinating. And I could have talked about them alone for hours, but let me just refrain from that temptation and let's come back to this particular issue. Now, it might seem like a bit of a surprise to you that the system is extremely sensitive to initial conditions and yet the trajectory always lands up in an attractor. However, next picture should be able to make that a bit clearer. In this picture, what we have shown is two such situations. There's the same butterfly wing-like structure which is being seen from a slightly different angle. And you have two different initial conditions here, shown by this blue and yellow cones, respectively. Now, for a long, long time, the orbit essentially looks exactly the same, but if you look at it closely, you will see at the end of our simulation, the blue cone has landed up here and the yellow cone has landed up here, very far away from each other. Remember, the whole thing is confined to this region. So be, the gap between this and this is actually huge compared to the gap between the original starting off points. This is what extreme sensitivity to initial conditions does for you. Now, extreme sensitivity to initial conditions is really all around us. Here, I'm going to show you a sequence of movies, there are six movies in one, which will illustrate the issue for a standard, simple physical system, a double pendulum. Here you see a picture where all six sets of double pendulum are being released by almost identical initial conditions. Not exactly identical, but very, very close to each other. And see what happens as they evolve in time. Let me also point out that these pictures are all inverted so that the downward direction is actually vertically up in these movies. Now pay attention to each of the pendula and see how the swing. As you can see, the sets seem to move almost identically at this stage. There is hardly any difference in their motions, and that's to be expected after all. They did start from very, very similar initial conditions. But by now, if you look carefully, you will see that the things are actually moving quite differently. In fact, the lower bottom one has started moving back almost before the top one did. And as you can see now, Almost all of the pendula are doing their own thing. They are moving almost completely independently of each other. This despite being governed by the same set of equations of Felix and also the same or nearly the same initial conditions. Now this idea of extreme sensitivity to initial conditions or the butterfly effect seems to overturn whatever people thought about classical physics. You are no longer in a position to claim that just by determining the initial conditions accurately enough, you will be able to make long-term predictions which are accurate. And indeed, this explained why things like weather is so notoriously difficult to predict in the long term. 
that it might occur to you that this discovery made Lawrence a household name overnight, but that didn't really happen. After all, Lawrence's work was published in a meteorological journal, and the general scientific audience, especially the physics or the mathematical audience, didn't really respond very well to that. They didn't even know about its existence. And at this stage, most scientists were inclined to ignore erratic behavior as aberrations, something that might have happened because some instrument acted up or maybe something happened from outside which was not under your control and so on. Now, in the early 70s, James York got hold of Lorenz's paper. And what he did was share the copy with lots of his friends. In particular, he shared a copy with his my friend, the mathematician, Stephen Smale. Smale at the time was doing pioneering work on dynamical systems. And many of his works actually exhibited the same kind of behavior that Lorenz's system was doing. And York took it upon himself to try to communicate Lorenz and Smale's ideas to a much bigger audience. Indeed, as part of the effort, and as part of some original work he had done in collaboration with T.Y. Lee, York co-authored a very, very famous paper. And in this paper, he actually coined the term chaos. This was when chaos was used for the first time in scientific literature. Indeed, the name of the paper was Period 3 Implies Chaos. And this rather provocative title actually helped in getting people's attention. And that apparently was York's basic idea. The editors had suggested a more mundane name for this, but York stood his ground and said that this is going to grab enough eyeballs. And that's what he wanted for this new set of ideas that has come up in mathematical physics. It turns out that York's result, that period 3 implies chaos, which essentially means that once a system like this has a period 3 orbit, an orbit which goes A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C in periods of 3, it is bound to have orbits of all sizes, was not really a unique original result. It happened to have been discussed, or rather was a special case of a result which Ukrainian mathematician, at the time of course he was called Soviet mathematician, Oleksandr Mikhailovich Sharkovsky had published in 1964. In fact, Sharkovsky had given a whole sequence of period sizes, which is shown in this picture just above his uh, portrait. What this means is suppose some particular system has an 18 order cycle, then all the cycle sizes listed before it would also occur in this system. And 3 is where of this whole sequence starts. And that means if a system has a period 3 cycle, it's bound to have a period 5, period 7, period 9, in fact, all integer size cycles. Now, because of the Cold War going on at that time and lack of scientific communication between the Russians and the Western scientists, Sharkovsky's work was largely unknown in the West. So, York's discovery was essentially done in vacuum. In fact, York later teamed up with Aligod and Sawyer to write one of the best textbooks on chaos, the one which you can see on your screen right now. So York did a lot to both advance the theory of chaos and popularize it. But perhaps one of his major contributions was to introduce the notion of chaos and Lorenz's work to a friend, a biologist, who was working on population dynamics at that time. We will meet this physicist turned biologist, Robert May, his beloved moth populations, cobwebs, and the map that changed the world in the next part of this lecture.